All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Leveraging Assessment and Evaluation for Student Success, Working Smarter, Not Harder. Today's webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advances evaluation in the AT community by offering trainings, cultivating an evaluation community, researching emerging topics, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out Evaluate's website to learn more. The slides from today's webinar are already on Evaluate's website, along with several other resources. You can also download these resources by following the link on the right side of your screen under the Handouts tab. The recording will be available within a couple days, and that will be emailed directly to you. So my name is Lissa wilson Becho, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I work with Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. Our presenters today are Robin Data, Amy Gullickson, Mia Chen, with the input from Arlen Gullickson from the AT Fast for ATE project. So we do want to recognize our colleagues who have worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, including our amazing Evaluate team, and a special thank you to Karen Lee Young from City College of San Francisco and Tom Pensabeni from Metropolitan Community College, who served as the ATE community reviewers and provided valuable feedback at our webinar rehearsal. We'd also like to recognize Carolyn William Noren, Evaluate's wonderful copy editor, and Fast for ATE would also like to thank Rick Polanin and Michael Fox from WellDead for their permission to share examples from their project. So this webinar is designed for individuals funded by the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and so on. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. So now I'll turn things over to Robin. Well, thank you, Lissa. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, on behalf of the FAS4 ATE2 team, I'd like to welcome you all to Leveraging Assessment and Evaluation for Student Success, Working Smarter, Not Harder. We have a tight hour scheduled and here's what we're going to work through. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use the registration survey to learn from you what we should focus on in this webinar. Then we'll work briefly through how we are rethinking assessment, how assessment works throughout the PD cycle, and what we're, what we're doing before asking you to engage in a small reflection exercise. And then we will conclude by talking a little bit more where our project is going and how you can access the resources we're developing and potentially get involved. Before I begin, I would like to give a land acknowledgement on behalf of our team. We respectfully acknowledge the indigenous peoples who are the traditional caretakers of the land. For where I am, they are the Snohomish, Snoqualmie, and Suquamish, and other Coast Salish peoples. For Amy and Mia in Melbourne, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And for Kalamazoo, home of Arlen and Evaluate TE, the Miami, Peoria, and Badawatami people. We also acknowledge the indigenous people who are the keepers of the land wherever you happen to be and pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. The FAS4 ATE team is all about using data collected from professional development activities for evaluation and formative assessment. This session will be recorded and made publicly available, so your participation is already your consent. We may use your data from this session in our reporting and publications, and I just want to let you know that. Participation in the Q&A via the chat function is, of course, voluntary. Your name won't be visible in the recording, but it will be in the chat transcript, and we'll de-identify you if we use anything that you say in our reporting. A little bit about the registration survey. So, on behalf of the team, I'd actually like to thank all of those of you who participated in our survey when you registered. We have a 70% response rate. And throughout our presentation today, we'll share aggregate responses in order to model the ideas we're working on in the project. 
and I'll start by telling you how we used your responses to help shape our session today. First, we were delighted to see how many of you already use assessment in your professional development activities. And we're excited to see how many of you are interested in learning about what we're doing and we hope using some of our resources that we've developed. And so based on our responses, we've adapted our webinar design in several ways. First, we shortened up the section describing assessment. Then we removed polls and added Q&A sections. We added more examples and content related to the tools that we've developed. And finally, we redefined our list of what we're looking for from the community for our next round of funding. So thank you all for taking the time to complete the survey. It really helped us tailor the webinar to what we hope your needs are. And now I'm going to hand this over to Amy to talk about why we're focused on assessment and how it, it relates to evaluation. Why it matters in professional development. I'll maybe shift your paradigm and then relate all of that to evaluation. Not bad for five minutes. In the pre-assessment responses, we are excited to see how many of you understand the importance of assessment for learning and how it relates to evaluation. And we're really excited to see how uh, willing you were to implement what you learned from our webinar. To start, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm going to share some definitions uh, and some principles in our paradigm. So what is assessment? It's the systematic basis for making inferences about the learning and development of students. It's the process of defining, selecting, designing, collecting, analyzing, interpreting, and using information to increase students' learning and development. In the old assessment paradigm, teachers do the work to create, grade, and report the findings of assessments, and evaluators might tally those outcomes in their reports. Students are the focus of the assessment. You can see them here at the bottom. They participate by completing the, those assessment tasks. In the paradigm we have at fast for ate everyone is an investigator. The learner and their learning are at the center of an inquiry process where data is exchanged all the time to help the learner learn. So you can see that here with a little plant in the middle. That's the learner's learning and everybody's focused on that. So to keep ourselves in this paradigm, because it's a shift, we use a few principles. The first is only the learner can learn. I'm just pausing because that can be pretty revolutionary for people. Only the learner can learn. The next principle is that teachers can facilitate that learning. And finally, assessments, that ongoing cycle of information exchange about the learner's progress. And it has to be integrated into the learning process to generate the most learning. So now how does evaluation relate to assessment? Evaluation is to fully describe and fully judge an educational program. And it covers the whole program, not just student learning, although you can see that there uh, underneath the magnifying glass. Evaluation seeks to understand what the program is doing, what it means to do, and how good it is, which gives you the little green check, hopefully. In our approach, assessment and evaluation work hand in hand to inform each other and to increase student learning. So what does the paradigm shift about assessment and its partnership with evaluation look like in real life? This example from WellDed's metallurgy course will demonstrate. So in this case, it looks like new items on their registration form. Originally, they just asked the standard registration questions on the left-hand side of the slide. The right side shows the additional pre-assessment items they added after working with us. These items help the learner clarify whether the learning objectives for the PD are of interest and how much they know in relation to them. The items also help the PD instructors to adapt their content according to what the uh, learners are bringing to the session, similar to what we did for our session today. So now it's over to you. What questions do you have for us related to assessment and evaluation?
So we are still waiting for our participants to put their questions in the chat, but I wanted to kick off with a question. You all have mentioned that this is a paradigm shift for some folks. I'm wondering if you could expand on why that might be and where are the key points that is shifting? Where's, where, what is really different um, between how people may see for learning or professional development right now versus this new paradigm? Mm -hmm. I think the uh, old school way of thinking about assessment has really been that the learning is partly the teacher's job. So that creation of assessment, um, the organizing of materials, the shaping of how that all works together is the job of the teacher. Um, when we're thinking about how to, if the learner is the only person that can learn, then the shift has to be to think about how all that can cre be created to help the learner do the learner's task. So it's a difference in responsibility, really. The teacher still has lots of things to do, but that still means facilitating of learning rather than um, trying to do the learning. Mia might have some thoughts about that too. Thanks, Amy. And also with this shift in paradigm, because we have this great responsibility on the learners. So by doing the formative assessment, we're helping to make their learning visible to them so that learners can take a more active approach in the learning and have more agency in the learning rather than passively receiving information mm -hmm. from the teachers. Um, they actually have an input in the program, what they want to know, where they want to drive their own learning. Mm -hmm. We've had a question come in from Val, which I think just helps us further think about this paradigm shift. Um, but she asks, how is it that the that only the learner is learning? Won't everyone else be learning as they are doing this work? Yep, great question, Val. And absolutely yes. I think the obviously the teacher's gonna be learning about the learner's learning during it gets to be a bit crazy with all the learning words, but the teacher will be getting a better understanding of how well learners are progressing as the learners are doing that together. But it's the reason we talk about only learners can learn is to have really focus that paradigm shift. So we're certainly not saying that other people can't learn. It's just that each person can only do their own learning. Hopefully that clarifies. Starting to be a little bit of a tongue twister, right? It does. We had mm -hmm. to think a lot about how many times to say learner and learning <laughs> in our materials. <laughs> We have another question from Rebecca who asks, how would you apply this change in paradigm when creating surveys, particularly in reference to climate surveys for the workplace? Oh, good question. I might have to think about that. The, um, I think it's, it, it has to do with agency, Rebecca. So that's a great question. And it depends on how you're asking the question. So if it's a place where um, you're expecting people to respond passively to what the climate is like for them, as opposed to actively about how did they contribute to the climate of the workplace, if I'm understanding the survey sort of content correctly, it's a shift in how um, you're asking that person to perceive themselves through completing the survey and, and perceive not only how the climate is created, but their contribution to creating that climate. We have one more question that's come in, and I, I know some of this I think might be expanded on in the next few sections, but Josephine asks um, about how to address survey fatigue, because the new approach will add to the number and they assume the depth of the questions in the survey. Yep, that was a great question. And that's, uh, thanks, Josephine. There's some things that we wondered about, actually, even with our own pre-assessment survey, we didn't know if anybody would do it and we didn't know if people would finish. Um, but for the most part, almost everybody that registered did and almost everybody that did got mostly to the end. So it's uh, that's a real question, and we did think about that in ours. So we only did two of the three kind of potential items. We Instead of asking about interest, we just asked about knowledge and willingness. So there's some choices that you can certainly make uh, out of the materials that we've created about what you want to include. Um, and it's about choosing the things that are going to give you the best information that you want to have to adapt your materials 
to kind of tailor things. So there's another example of an item that Welded included a bit further down the track in the webinar. And you might want to just choose one or two kind of high value items to add. And I'd just like to add that also determine the kinds of questions that you're going to ask and make it very, very easy for people just to mm -hmm. click, 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 rather than have to really spend an awful lot of time interacting or putting in text, that kind of stuff. So the easier you can make the survey, um, the more likely it is that people are going to complete it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know Sam has put one more question in there, but I'm actually going to suggest that we move on to the next section. And Sam, I have your question noted. So we will, we have another question answer session coming up. All right. So this is me again. Okay. How does assessment work in the life of PD? Oh, no, it's Mia. Hi, Mia. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay, Amy. Yep. So, um, so in our registration survey, we also asked you to rate your current knowledge and willingness to implement assessment in professional development. So the majority of the participants reported to have some knowledge of assessment. And we're again very excited to see that more than 80% of the participants has very strong willingness to implement assessment in PD. So here is a basic theory of change for PD, which you are probably very familiar with. On this page, you can see a range of things that can be measured throughout this process. The amount of text here shows that there are so many things that we can measure to see how things are going, but we don't always get them all. When we look at the PD theory of change and worked backwards through a logic model, we discovered the only way to measure all the things was to plan ahead. So in our project, we're just focusing on the first bit, which is highlighted on this page, and students in the workforce can be someone else's project. As Amy mentioned in the previous section, it is important that assessment and evaluation are integrated throughout the life cycle of PD projects, and this is what we're working on at fast for ate In order to help us conceptualize all the things that needs to happen, to prep for the final stages so that we can collect student-level learning data, we developed this roadmap, which represents the life cycle of PD with a road. So before the PD, you will need to develop learning objectives and clarify them so that they are targeting various levels of learning. You will also need to create a PD application form, which includes pre-assessments that helps you understand participants' current knowledge, interest, and willingness to implement the learning. And this is something similar to the questions you completed in the registration survey for this workshop. It is also a good idea to include the contractual agreement in the application form, which collects participants' consent and specifies the expectations of data collection. You will also need to design formative assessment to be used before and in the PD and also in the participants' home classrooms. As illustrated here in this roadmap, this process might not be linear and you might need to iterate a few times to get learning objectives, formative assessments, and the application form all aligned with each other. During the PD, you will model teaching using formative assessments, talk about how to assess on learning objectives, assess your participants' learning outcomes, and also model practices where learners present and interpret the assessment results. These activities will hopefully stimulate rich discussions among the PD participants regarding the effectiveness of assessments and how they can adapt these assessment strategies for their home classrooms. And after PD, when the participant teacher is back in their classroom, support needs to continue to help them deliver the learning modules. 
you might consider create a community of practice to support them in using formative assessment to increase learning and helping themselves and also their students understand the impacts of learning so that they're able to gather and report those outcomes back to your project team. As Amy highlighted before, assessment and evaluation working hand in hand in this process, and they support each other in collecting the data that help to inform your project development and also promote learners' learning. Over Thanks, to you, Mia. Amy. So, so um, now it's my turn to talk about what uh, is fast for ATE doing with assessment. And some of your questions, Sam, I think are going to get answered in this section. So once we mapped out this life cycle of professional development and the theory of change and figured out all the things that PIs and evaluators needed to do to plan ahead, we knew people would need help. So we began creating and then testing resources to support assessment and evaluation in professional development. In this section, I'll give you a brief preview of a resource just so you can see what it looks like. And I'll talk through some examples. So this is an example of our professional development application template. So um, for those of you who are curious about how we did the pre-assessment survey that you completed, we use this tool. <laughs> Each resource like this one includes outcomes, an explanation of why you should care about the topic, and information to help you understand and use it in your projects. So over the last several years, we've been testing the resources we've been developing in our project work. And first, we've been doing it on my students at the University of Melbourne in a class that I teach called Developing Evaluation Capacity. In the last two years, we're also really fortunate to work with WeldEd, uh, and they partnered with us to pilot test a variety of our resources. So we worked with them on two of their projects, the metallurgy mod module that they run in the summertime, and on Rick's course at the ML American Welding Society Instructors Institute. So both of these were affected by COVID, and we didn't really get as far as we wanted to, but what they helped us with has been fantastic. So um, with them, we worked, we just had ongoing conversations to help them figure out how to integrate formative assessment and evaluation. And that in turn helped us refine our resources. So we went with them over several sessions. And first we discussed uh, learning objectives and formative assessment. And we used our tools and templates that are featured on the slide here to support those conversations. And doing that, we discovered we needed to iterate among the guides that we show here around learning objectives, integrating assessment and, app, and the application form just to get those all aligned with each other. That took a bit of uh, circling around and repetition. Those conversations led to a revision of their metallurgy registration form, which I, I highlighted one of the changes they made above, but this is a second. In addition um, to the interest and knowledge items, well, that included a request for a weld failure example on the registration form. So the intent was to connect the intended learning uh, to the participants experience even before they arrived at the professional development and also to provide real life examples for the PD group to work on in the workshop itself. So doing this model adult learning principles, the formative assessment approach that Rick would use in his teaching and created an emotional connection with the content, which makes the learning stickier for learners. For the Instructors Institute, they didn't have any pre-assessment, so we talked with Rick about how he could gather information related to the learning goals for that course. The result was that he wanted to see what participants were thinking about learning and what their views were before and after the session to see if those views had changed. So we designed these items together um, about how they thought they learned best, how they thought their students learned best, and um, how they might find out what a student understood during their teaching. Rick was also willing to give community a practice a try. And so um, rather than just doing a standard evaluation survey at the end of his professional development to support his participants in learning what they learned, or thinking about their learning and also helping their students learn, we added a community of practice option. So um, that went on the last, on the lesson plan assignment that you can see here. So we just basically stuck in a QR code and an invitation to participate in that community of practice. And so um, that went out with the assignment that they had to do for that particular uh, session. 
So now that you've seen the roadmap and some examples, we're curious about the questions you have for us. The last ones were good and curly, so bring it up. Well, I want to start off by going back to Sam's question. And so Sam asked, in what ways can you give students more agency beyond just asking them to participate sure. in surveys? That's a great question, Sam. And what you'll find in our materials are heaps of ideas about how to do just that. And I might hand over to Mia to say a bit more about that. Is that all right, Mia? Yeah, sure. Um, so Sam, I hope. Um, some of my presentation answered that question. So you can see throughout the whole PD process in that roadmap, uh, apart from before the PD, where we collect data about what the students really want to learn, what's their confusion, what do they want to know about through your workshop, that will help you to actually um, adapt the content of the workshop and the way that you present it, so it actually caters to the needs of the students. And during the workshop, um, there are a lot of opportunities for the students to give feedback feedback um, to present their ideas about you know what they want to learn next and what are the things that really helped what are the uh, teaching that's not really um, suited their needs so that we can have that um, immediate adjustment throughout the whole process and also um, the students are able to drive their own learning mm -hmm. and then after the workshop again we actually teaching the students to do that in their home classroom um, so that they can actually gather the data using the data to inform their own learning but also supporting their own students as well i think yeah, I'd, like just, I'd just like to add on to what mira said really it's about making this whole process as transparent and as possible and bringing the students in to to actually shape their particular experience so that's how you give them agency by involving them in a transparent way um, to shape what you're doing and what they're what they where they want to go. One of the things that's really popular in STEM is problem based learning. And so helping the students define what the problems are that they're going to explore. So letting them do the reading. This can be great for professional development because you're going to have people who've already been trying to teach similar things probably in their classroom. And so what have they experienced that was challenging to teach and using those as examples to work on in the classroom can be really helpful. If you're in a community college or high school classroom, um, then it's having the students think critically about what's, what are the places this thing could fail? What are the things that we need to think about ahead of time and what, what, what might we do or investigate to make sure that those fails don't happen. So, and that can be true across any of the kind of content that you might be teaching. There's lots of ideas in the content that we've presented in the handouts that you'll get. So that all the links to that are in the stuff that you'll get from Lissa uh, that give you specific examples of ideas that you can use to help shift that agency to students. So if anyone else has additional questions or comments, please feel free to write them in the chat. Um, I actually have two more questions for you. First, I want to make sure that we're, we're distinguishing our use of students, right? Because there are students in the classroom and then there are students of the professional development workshop, right? Who in, in another context would be considered faculty. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're being clear about that. Um, and then I would love to hear working with the folks at WellDead, um, I, I have heard behind the scenes, but I, I would wonder, I would love for you to share with our participants about some of their aha moments or some of the, the aspects that they have really appreciated in, in shifting their thinking to this new assessment model. In the materials, we, we put definitions of each of those things. So participant is a person who comes along to the PD and is a teacher in the classroom. That's a great question, Listen, And then students are the students in the classroom. Usually we're, we've been sloppy in our language today and that's, but it's clear in the materials. That's a great question. Um, I've, I feel like Rick probably is the, and, and Michael are the best to answer the aha moments. But I think what we observed was that idea of getting information before people come to the classroom was big. Um, that was something that other than, you know, kind of their name and where they're from, asking them to, to think about implementation before they even come to the session. Uh, so part of what NSF is about is making sure that the things that they do get back to those home classrooms or that they have some impact beyond just the session 
of, of professional development. So that was really important. Um, just getting all that kind of data collection stuff out there in the world as part of that pre-assessment process. So consent to um, participate, uh, you know, making a commitment basically that you're signing a contract to come and accept free NSF stuff in some case. And that means that it's not actually free, that there's an expectation that you report um, on how you're implementing and that kind of stuff ahead of time can really just set the whole project up so that people are understanding that collecting data and talking about how the learning is going is part of the package. So I think that was probably a big shift for them. Um, and thinking about using it as a way to get information to help teach was good too. So you really do have to balance it with Josephine's question, like how many things can you ask before it's too many things in that pre-assessment space. Um, but you can do that, you know, with some forethought and probably some practice. We pilot tested things with people to say, is this too many questions? And um, and got an answer. So it's a way to just sort of experiment and see fundamentally what needs to happen to work best for your individual professional developments, whatever you're offering. I think pilot testing survey questions or other data collection instruments is always very important. And I can see it being particularly important in this case. Yes. So we have two questions. I don't know if I can make them both go up. I cannot. Uh oh, I can see Josephine the window. Asked, all right, good. So Josephine asked if you could describe a little bit more about how the community of practice works as a part of the evaluation cycle. And similarly, Lauren asked, can you give an example of the community of practice assessment used in this project? Yes. So this is one of the things we didn't get done on account of COVID. So um, what we set up the community of practice to do is to be a place where people who are delivering in the classroom, so participants in the professional development who've gone back to their home classrooms and are doing delivery to their own students, could come back together and talk about it. And so there's some simple ways to do data collection there would be to talk about um, how it's going, record those sessions, those could be transcribed or just kind of lessons learned could come out of those. Um, we, what we're aiming to do is help professional development deliverers think about what's the data collection you wanna get from those classrooms and how, and using that community of practice to help people be able to do that reporting so that you're not just sending a spreadsheet or asking some kind of vague request for data, but you've got a structure and you help them to use it. But um, one of the things I do in my other life is think about how people learn evaluation. And one of the things I did was just do kind of a systematic analysis similar to this about what happens after somebody does training and how do you make it stick. And that community of practice is really important because quite often people will do something one time in professional development or in studying with us at a university, but to make it really part of their practice, somebody has to do a thing successfully five times based on the research. And so community of practice is a great place to help people think about, okay, well, I'm doing this for the second time. How do I, what am I learning? Um, what are other people learning to help embed that change in practice for them and then make that difference for their students? This, the paradigm shifts real. And so it's really hard, I think, for teachers to totally shift how they're thinking about teaching and the community of practice will help make that sticky. I can see Mia nodding emphatically. Did you want to say something, Mia? Yeah. No, it was great. great. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. I just can't agree more. <laughs> All right, well, I know we have more content to get through and I think we can um, add some more time for questions at the end as well. So remember, um, you can put questions in the chat at any point and we'll make sure to bring it up during the next question and answer session. All right. Thanks for your questions, they've been great. Okay, well, um, thank you all again also for your questions. Um, right now, what we'd like to do is take a little bit of a pause and have you reflect a little bit. And in specific, we would like you to take a couple of minutes to jot down your thoughts about what you've learned so far in this, in this, in these 34 minutes or so. Um, so what have you learned, whether or not this really matters, or what changes you might want to make. 
So if you'd like to um, post these thoughts in the chat, that would be wonderful, but you can keep them to yourself as well. So Lisa, can you just start a clock for two minutes and just let people do what they do? I can indeed, two minute clock started. That's a nice question, Sarah. And Amy, while people are working, could you talk a little bit about why, uh, why you have to practice five times and uh, why not three or seven? I will, but I want to just stay quiet so people can think. Yeah. All right, we have reached our two minute mark. Thanks, Lisa. I'm just enjoying reading the chat about all the things that people are planning to implement. I'd appreciate it if you just keep entering those um, while I answer the question about why five times. So um, I think the that's a, it's a research. It was research study. It was John Hattie is a, a mentor and a colleague of of mine and of our project and visible learning is the thing that he did it was a meta analysis of more than 800 studies on actually what helps people what helps students so classroom students learn and this so all of this work is based on his research and that uh, synthesis and the ongoing research that surrounded it and so when i was chatting with him a few weeks ago he was the one who gave me the five times rule and cited some research that i haven't read yet so um, but I, my hunch is it's an average, so some students might pick things up, you know, in three and some might pick it up in seven. I know that's certainly true for me as an individual person, some things I get more quickly than others. But I think the important message here isn't the number of times, it's just that one time isn't enough. And so even if we do uh, do something with a student or with a participant in, in PD or in our classrooms one time, it's not going to be enough for them to change their practice. And we have to think about how are we going to help them um, once they leave us to be able to um, arrange situations where learners can keep on learning. Okay. Well, please do keep um, putting your, your thoughts in the chat if you wish. Um, but I would like to talk a little bit about a few changes that you can make right now. Um, so the very first thing is that you can write only learners, only the learner can learn on a post-it note and stick it on your desk and your, or your computer as a reminder, a constant reminder of this sort of change that we're, we're talking about. Get some data collection in your application or registration forms and make a plan to actually share it back with your participants. And if you need help with that, you can talk with your evaluator for help with online platforms and how to think about that. Add in one formative assessment moment in each day of content that you can use to shape. You can look at it at the end of the day and say, okay, 
this is what we need to do tomorrow, perhaps, or you can you can make course corrections on the fly using this. Um, and then finally, make a plan for how to connect with people after they've left the training. So, establishing a community of practices is is, uh, is 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 one very very good way of doing that. But also, you can you can, can just consider like letting them know that you're going to check in with them in a few weeks or whatever just to see how things are going okay so at the end of this in fact the the handout for all of our resource with all of our resources and stuff is available to you actually already in the if you go to the chat and then the handouts tab you'll, you'll be able to get to it i think um including some things that we didn't actually discuss uh today but i'd like to take a few moments actually now and talk a little bit about what's next for uh, our project, the FAS for ATE project. So our current project focuses on increasing learning and access to student level data by incorporating formative assessment into professional development projects. Like many projects, uh, as, as Amy alluded, the pandemic forced us to modify our project. And we actually have to thank our advisory team and program officer, Connie Della Piana, for, for their support in, in uh, allowing us to change things up. One thing we did manage to do, in addition to working with WellDed, uh, is to conduct a case study with the Community College of San Francisco and UC San, San Francisco Biotech Internship Training Program. And we're actually finalizing this study and we'll be sending it out for publication soon. But our preliminary analysis indicates that incorporating an equity lens when structuring program activities and consistently using formative assessment creates stronger program outcomes. And that was intriguing to us, and that's going to inform our next, uh, uh, our next, our next proposal, uh, which we, in which we would like to explore ways of using formative assessment to help build a more holistic and equitable framework for professional development programs and activities. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we'd like to, um, to ask you to come along with us. Uh, so we're currently seeking partners within and outside ATE, and we're looking for PIs and evaluators who want to pilot test our tools, including emerging PIs. We're going to be partnering with Mentor Connect. Uh, PIs, evaluators, and project staff who are already engaged in good practices to participate in, in case studies so that we can learn from them uh, to, and share good ideas for others to implement. Uh, we're looking for experts in assessment, evaluation, and of course, uh, anti-racist and equity practices and the nexus between all of these. Uh, and then finally, re oh, not finally, sorry, researchers who can help us access existing knowledge and resources within the literature on this. And of course, we need a new evaluator because our current evaluator is retiring uh, and, uh, and so we need somebody new. Uh, and with that, I wanna thank you for spending time with us today and for your questions and your, and your comments. Please do get in touch with us if you have any follow-up questions. Our contact information is listed here and also on the handout. And so uh, I'm gonna turn this back over to Alyssa and we can deal with some more questions if anybody has them, but then she can also do the, the webinar wrap up. So thank you. Thank you so much, Robin, Amy, and Mia. I'm gonna go ahead and launch our feedback survey. Um, so that you all have access to that. Oops. Um, but while I go and do that, I, I also want to open it up for for additional questions or comments. Here we go. Share now. <laughs> There's a question hiding in someone's comment, Lisa, that I spotted and I want to answer. So yes, um, please. Somebody said you're excited for the idea of participatory shift from traditional surveys to involving the students and teachers, but I'm concerned for how to incentivize the instructors to be willing to have more of the be involved in the evaluation process without some sort of compensation. Um, they may see it as more work on their end and wondering if we have some buy ins to get them on board. That is an absolutely important and real question. And so part of what we've been thinking about in, in our application and proposal for this next round of funding is how do we add in mini grants or something to help people carve out time to do this work? Because what we know from working with the welded guys was it's probably, you know, an extra two or three days of work to think through how to how to integrate the assessment. Um, if you're going to build new assessments, that's going to be even more time. 
um, Rick and Michael were both already on, on turned on about formative assessment and that was how Rick was doing his practice, but it still took some work and time to get it done. So we have, we're thinking about how do we build in resources into the money that we're gonna ask for to help support people to be able to do that. But I think part of working with Mentor Connect is also to help people who are preparing to do uh, PD um, responses to the ATE call for proposals to um, add that budget in and for, for us to be able to say to NSF, we know that it takes X amount of time for people to do this work so that they have some um, resources to cite to say, look, we're asking for this amount of money to do this bit because we know it's really important, but it actually pays big dividends at the end. I wonder too, if you could talk about revisit that that idea at the beginning about um, assessment versus evaluation, but also how assessment and evaluation. So just a little bit more on how some of these assessment practices inform that project level evaluation. So if you've done assessment in the classroom, you've got data on hand. And so that's data about either your participants learning if you're it's in the PD classroom or data about your students learning if it's in your home classroom. And part of that is thinking about how do you share that back with your evaluator so it can be part of the story of how your project is going or how it's doing. Sorry, I've really gotten into Australian vernacular since I've been in Australia. Um, so the um if it, part of it is also thinking about the ethical challenges of getting that classroom level data from students and the way to, to solve that is to do aggregates so you're looking at what's the aggregate result of learning uh you know how well did students do on your assessments um if you do a pre-post what does that look like um if you ask uh, your participants for instance at the pd to to rate themselves at the end what do you feel like you knew before and what do you feel, you know, how, what, how would you rate your learning now? That's one way to get at that information. If you have the aggregate assessment information, you can look at de-identified, um, you know, how do people perform on the assessment and how are people, what does that mean about what they learned? You could do the same thing in a home classroom to be able to look at that distribution of scores and look at and ask students how they felt about their learning before and after. So there's ways to make sure that that data actually makes it from the classroom or the PD classroom into the evaluation, but you have to have systems in place to be able to um, share that information with your evaluator. So that's part of this conversation. And that's why PIs and evaluators really need to work on this stuff together, because pretty often evaluators will have an idea about how they want to get data in using Qualtrics or other kinds of things. And so that kind of combination of the two is really important to get that system sorted out. Absolutely. You know, in a conversation just yesterday, someone was asking in that data collection phase, who is responsible for collecting that data? And it, it, I think particularly within ATE context, that's so difficult to answer because it depends on the project. It depends on how things are set up from the start. But ideally, it is a collaboration between yeah. project staff and evaluation teams because project staff have that trust, that relationship with yeah. participants, whether that's faculty or students or um, anyone really. Uh, and, and the evaluation team can really benefit from pulling on those mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The, do you want to talk about the case studies, Mia or Robin? Because that was a great example, I think, of they did pulse surveys in their training and then that um, was part of what went into the evaluation was just talking about that. Um, yeah, so um, um, we did a case study with one of the project team and um, so in that case study what's really unique is that the evaluator was working really closely with um, the project team. Um, so the evaluator was helping with interpreting some of the data. So because of um, the active involvement, actually, when it comes to the report time, the evaluator was very clear, you know, about what kind of data that can already go into the evaluation report that actually shows the impact of um, the project, which is really great to see. I think the other thing, just going back to Josephine's question earlier about survey fatigue, Lissa, is that so we, Lissa and I had a chat about the the survey that happens at the end of the webinar 
because you know we had asked you these specific questions as part of the pre-assessment and so we thought about do we want to ask those questions again at the end but of course Lissa's team already has a fantastic end of webinar survey that really covered the same kind of things that we would have asked but in a more aggregate way so even if you look at their survey that's another example of things that you could, that, you know, a way that you could capture information at the end that would relate to that pre-assessment kinds of questions. Even if it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, you can still uh, make an argument, like in your writing up from the evaluation about whether or not people actually learned on the things that we were talking about because of the questions that Lissa's team asks. So um, it doesn't have to be long and involved like we could have we could have put in all the pre-assessment things into the survey but it wouldn't have been helpful and it would have been an redundant i think and that's what we agreed when we chatted about it so that like the conversation between the people who are delivering and the people who are evaluating is so important to answer those questions about what's what, what's realistic in terms of uh, how much time people will spend or attention will they give to a task and and also that balance between getting the right amount of information so that you can report on how well things are going. So we had another question come in the chat, particularly about the, the difference again between assessment for participants and reflective self assessments on skills and skill development. Um, and so Kate asks, with self assessments, how do you frame or frame questions or analyze recognizing that many participants have a bias towards higher assessments, assessments PF their own knowledge and skills before they have been introduced to a topic. That's uh, a great, yeah, that's, that's a great question. People always overestimate <laughs> their knowledge of the topic. Um, I, there's a great, if you Google Dunning-Kruger effect, you'll find a hilarious slide about what that looks like, which always means people who don't know very much think that they're super smart. And once people start to develop expertise, they don't think they're smart at all. And so quite often you're going to be in this space, which is why that asking the question at the end about um, that sort of what evaluators call a retrospective pre-post. So you're at the end of the PD and you say, OK, now that you've done this learning, how would you rate what you knew before and how would you rate what you know now? Because it helps people think about how they've shifted in their understanding about what there was to learn and how smart they are about it. So that's absolutely a great question and a real problem. And so asking people at the beginning uh, can often be sort of a false pre-post because they might think that they know more than they really do because they don't have the same frame of reference. So the, that asking before is great for helping them think about how they want to come into the learning, but asking them at the end in that retrospective way about the pre post can also be really helpful to also to let them see how their understanding of the topic has shifted over the course of the professional development or in the classroom over the course of whatever it is they, the content that they've learned. Thank you, Amy. I, we still have a few minutes for questions or comments if anyone has any lingering thoughts. But I would like to ask the presenters, is there anything that you expected to be asked today that people haven't asked? Talking about not knowing what you don't know yet. I think that's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's it's a, a tough that's question. A good question. Yeah. Hmm. I think the um, the I, yeah. I hadn't really thought about what people are going to ask. I was mostly worried about making sure we were clear about what we were presenting. Well, certainly, certainly, the focus on what would a community of practice look like. That's something I think that needs some more explanation. Um, what are best practices for doing that? Would be would be a useful thing. So uh, that was that was uh, so that's one of the things that I've taken away to think about specifically mm -hmm. in this like there was... context. Yeah. Yeah. Good interest in that. Kate did and, ask a follow-up question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Amy. I was just gonna say, in relation to community practice, you're not gonna find much stuff 
in our resources about that because we didn't get that far. So um, it's important to just like if it's a thing that you're interested in, just get in touch. We'd be happy to work with you to figure out uh, how to make that work for you. And we're um, in that next round of funding, we'll be working on thinking about how to do that. So hey, Kate has a follow-up question. They write, do you ever use performance assessments in which participants have to demonstrate their understanding or skills rather than just self-assessing, similar to what we might do with student assessments? Yes. <laughs> I think yeah, the difference is, is how you structure it in the yeah. classroom space. Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, I don't see how you could avoid that, especially if you're working on something that's skills based. Uh, but that's not something we have particularly focused on. I think that's really highly contextual. Mm. And based on the outcomes for your PD. But there's a um, we do have a tool called rethinking quizzes that basically goes to that. So if you're going to use a quiz, you know, like a regular standard student assessment, and you might use that, for instance, in the professional development session with your participants so they can try it out. But the way that you use the quiz can be quite different. So you're still gathering the information about actual student performance in terms of their learning tasks. But the use of it is that the students might help you design the quiz based on what they understand they need to know. Um, students might uh, analyze, they might mark their own quiz or they might mark each other's in that standard pass your paper around kind of way. Um, but then they might discuss together to look and, at and interpret the responses from the test. So rather than that being the teacher's job to get all that information in and look at the distribution and who seems what kind of mistakes were made and what does that mean for teaching, that becomes a, a task that the students do together. So you have um, that kind of data sharing is part of the classroom climate and part of normal activities in the space so that the students are are engaged in understanding their own learning and the learning of their peers and what people have misunderstood and helping to figure out how do we address those things that people don't seem to have quite grasped and so it's a quite different way of thinking about how to use a quiz uh, than just a standard do a quiz uh, hand back the marks with some comments Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. This has been a really uh, wonderful conversation and so much to think about and continue to learn about with the resources that you have posted on your website. Um, as a reminder, the recording of today's webinar will be shared with everyone who attended and anyone who registered and might not have been able to make it, along with uh, links to all of the resources that we have been talking about. Um, before we close, I do want to give a shout out to our upcoming web chat. Uh, the next web chat is on May 24th. So these are pretty informal virtual spaces that evaluate holds for anyone who's interested in talking about evaluation. Um, each month we hold these, they're normally topic based. I believe May is just a check in with your evaluation. So how's it going? What do you what do you struggle with? What's going really well? Come share, talk to others who are just as excited about evaluation as you are. Right. And then finally, a reminder that evaluation offers um, uh, those working on an ATE project to connect with an evaluation coach. So whether you just want to bounce ideas off of someone, have them look at a survey instrument, maybe uh, talk about uh, integrating assessment into your evaluation or anything else that happens to be on your mind. Keith, Amy and Lola are uh, wonderful and they would love to work with you as well. So a final thank you to all of our presenters and to everyone who joined us today. Thank you so much. Hope to see you again next webinar. Thank you. Thanks for all the great questions and thanks, Lissa, for hosting. Thank you.